Welcome back. Ladies and gentlemen, I don't even know where to begin. I do know where to begin. Today, I wanna to be talking about the strengths of desktop Linux. Um, when it comes to what this channel has been about for such a long time, it has, uh, it has looked at all kinds of Linux desktops in their various myriad of iterations, uh, whether it's been uh, all of the countless Ubuntu derivatives, whether it's been the bare bones Arch Gen 2 systems, whether it's been uh, some of the more recent movers and shakers like Elementary and Pop! OS, uh, the, the Linux desktop landscape has, has changed significantly since I first started this channel almost 10 years ago by the end of this year. And so what I wanted to do is I wanted to kick off a series that talks about the case for different desktop Linux operating systems. And today is just going to be kind of the opener to this series, a short exposition as to why I think desktop Linux has strengths and a place in the current marketplace of, uh, of computer operating systems. Uh, and there's some very specific examples that I'm going to draw on through this video. But um, first of all, I just like to thank all of you who have stuck around with this channel for such a long time and seen it go through several iterations. I hope you enjoy its latest iteration and I'll be doing my best to kind of give a, a slightly broader perspective maybe than what I have done with uh, distro reviews and all that kind of thing in the past. I feel like the landscape of desktop Linux is changing and I think we need to grow and mature as a community as the Linux desktop grows and matures. So without further ado, we're gonna get into the strengths of the Linux desktop. Okay, so number one, the most basic ones that it's easy to talk about are the four S's of the Linux desktop. That is speed, stability, security, and support. Let me quickly unpack those and then I'm gonna move on because you probably have read these in an article somewhere already. So first of all, speed. It's easy to know that the Linux desktop is tailor-made for different scenarios and you can make it, pare it down as hard as you want and make it run as fast as you want on whatever hardware you have around, whether it's a 15 year old laptop or a one year old uh, workstation beast. It doesn't really matter. The Linux desktop is gonna be fast comparatively, uh, no matter what you put it on. Next thing, security. Again, I'm gonna come back to this in as it applies to the desktop space very soon. But when it comes to security in the Linux world, um, Linux as a, as a kernel, as an operating system, as a system of binaries and libraries and the rest of it, inherently has a very secure architecture. But in the desktop space especially, I think the security model that's been applied in the Linux desktop is better than what uh, Windows have had in terms of the user account control settings in Windows 10 and previous iterations of Windows. And it's also vastly better, I think, than, uh, than the current user space of Mac OS Catalina. Uh, with its Vista-esque pop-ups of, do you want to allow this? Are you sure? Are you sure? Are you sure? Um, so I'll come back to that in just a minute as it applies to app distribution and software availability uh, on the Linux desktop. Uh, when it comes to stability, you can run a Linux desktop operating system that is as bleeding edge or as rock solid stable as you so desire. And that also ties into support. When it comes to support for the desktop, Linux operating system, you can have options out there that are supported either for free or commercially available supported uh, for five, 10 years and beyond. This all boils down to Linux's heritage in the server space where web infrastructure relies on the stability that the Linux kernel and the binaries and libraries around it provide. So if you build a desktop OS out of that base, you're going to get a really stable, secure, speedy, and well-supported desktop operating system. I hope I'm making sense. These are general, these are making general generalizations is the word I'm looking for. Um, but I think all of those are true. Okay, here's where things are gonna get a little bit deep in the weeds. Number two, I think a big strength of desktop Linux right now in 2020 is the lack of pro desktop user space in the Mac and the Windows world. Now, let me explain myself. Windows 10 and Mac OS are both aimed at serving a largely consumer base. Their business models reflect this in a free upgrade cycle for those who already have the hardware. And also their app distribution method is gradually becoming more and more locked down. 
Um, this is for good reason for those who have a consumer based laptop. They just want to browse the internet, install some stuff. Having managed OSs is much easier to keep them running well and keep them secure um, over a long period of time. Whereas um, I think this steps on the toes of professional uh, workstation grade people that need a desktop to be able to do what they want it to do, not necessarily what the company who owns the software wants them to do. So case in point, when uh, when Mac OS decides that they're gonna end 32-bit support, then it leaves a lot of creative professionals high and dry because the plugins will no longer work with their operating system. And there will come a point where you will have to upgrade to whatever version of Mac OS is available um, because if you wanna still receive security updates from Apple, you will need the latest operating system. Uh, and in the Windows case, ending support for various libraries or frameworks is a relatively common practice. And so those relying on professional software are at the mercy of the business decisions of the companies that own that particular software. So the lack of pro-grade desktop OS uh, available through Mac OS and Windows in the current market leaves a great space for stable professional desktop Linux operating systems to jump in and fill that void. And in a lot of cases, this is already starting to happen. When you look at the uh, creative professional industry, and especially in the video editing, filmmaking, and animation space, more and more workstations, animation studios, and film studios are turning to Linux workstations to provide professional desktop features to their employees. And DaVinci Resolve is a great example of professional software that was originally built to run on the Linux desktop and has since been ported out to Mac and Windows. And anecdotally speaking around the internet, you'll usually find that if you are running DaVinci Resolve on its native Linux platform, it will actually run better and run more stable than the ports that are available for Mac and Windows. Um, all of this kind of boils down to the fact that a lot of high-end professional software, so software that you're paying thousands to use, to license, and to own, uh, I could see a world where they start targeting the Linux desktop as a platform for those serious professional grade users. Now, what does that mean for the rest of us regular consumers? I think the, the trend of Chromebooks, iPads, and uh, lockdown Windows devices will become the norm in the consumer space. But I do think for people that want to take computer work seriously, desktop Linux is going to become a very viable um, option for them. So the third strength that I believe the desktop Linux operating system has is that it has a much more logical app distribution method than both Mac OS and Windows in the current market. Let me explain myself. Um, at the moment, the Windows 10 um, application user space of how you install software is all over the shop. You have .exes that you can download, you have .msis that you can download and install from anywhere on the internet. And while it is getting harder to be able to install unsigned .exes and .msis to your device, it is still possible to do that and allow those uh, particular applications access to not root level, but almost administrator level features on your operating system. Now on the flip side in Windows, you still have the Windows 10 or Microsoft Store uh, that, that you can put your app in that store and it will get downloaded and sandboxed appropriately. Um, however, again, you're relying on the mercy of Microsoft as an app distributor to package that properly and, uh, and maintain that as a marketplace for your software. Now you do have other methods of installing software on Windows, but I'm not gonna get into that. Let's look at Mac OS very quickly. Mac OS basically has one option these days, almost all but one option. It's the App Store. You basically have to get your software in the App Store if you want it installed on Mac OS. Now, I will preface this by saying that if you wish to turn off security features that are built into Mac OS Catalina by default, you can install things like uh, Homebrew Package Management or just a signed app or dot app files from the internet. But the trajectory that Apple is on is towards more and more managed uh, operating system and closing off more and more of those administrator level settings and features from the user so that the user doesn't um, screw up their device basically. Um, but it does mean that the a lot of the developers out there trying to make professional grade applications available for their different platforms are uh, left high and dry because they are discouraged from targeting those admin level 
uh, access on an operating system. Okay, now what have we got in the Linux space? We've got a lot of different options. And at times it looks very scattershot and very discompobulated, if that's a word. Um, but this is the simple version. You've got package management. It's been around forever and it's a very, very efficient way of installing software, keeping your system up to date and installing stuff with a minimum amount of extra cruft accumulating on your system. Then you have the more secure universal uh, application install methods. You have AppImage, you have Flatpak, and you have Snap Packages. All of these have different um, abilities and, and features and pros and cons. But the beauty of this is that, wait for it, your applications are not tied to the version of the operating system that you are using underneath it. This means, in theory, you could have a rock solid, stable operating system that is going to be professionally supported by the company that offers it for 5, 10, 15 years and still run up to date, secure software sandboxed in your operating system. Uh, and then it just keeps rolling on and updating without affecting any of the other elements in your OS. This is a killer feature that I don't think a lot of uh, desktop users realize that Linux has. Now in the server space and in the infrastructure space, this is very important, which is why things like Ubuntu's um, Snapcraft team and Snap Packages as a whole work incredibly well in that environment. But their application on the desktop side of things, I think is only just getting recognized. But with better security permissions, better control over access to the system and an easier development target base means that potentially more software, professional grade software, be it open source or otherwise, can make its way to the Linux desktop with minimal developer effort. Now we've come a long way in the last few years and I think my fourth and final reason that I think is a strength of the Linux desktop is that we've come a long way in the last few years attracting developers to our platform. And big players, even Microsoft, have helped to a degree in this transition. Um, a lot of big professional software is available now on the Linux desktop because of all the reasons that I just explained before. But the most notable absences from the Linux desktop are the Microsoft Office 365 productivity suite, the Adobe Creative Cloud suite, and depending on who you are, a lot of people really like, like the uh, Affinity Designer uh, applications, and it would be great to see them come to Linux as well. But there are a lot of professional players out there who have ported or migrated or started developing their software for Linux because guess what? That's what their developers want to use. And we're seeing great uptake from OEMs such as Lenovo wanting to ship Fedora on select workstations. There are workstations out there from Dell which can ship with Ubuntu. And there are a myriad of excellent OEM manufacturers of Linux specific hardware. What I'm hoping to do over the coming videos is look at different examples of the Linux desktop in its current form. There are a lot of excellent projects to admire and to learn from. And hopefully by looking into these, we can showcase some alternatives here on this channel for what might suit your particular needs. So whether you're a gamer, creative professional, developer, um, business manager, I don't know, whatever it is, hopefully you can find helpful stuff on this channel. And over the coming weeks or whenever I can get these videos out, we'll be focusing on some of the biggest players. Players like Ubuntu, Pop! OS, Fedora, the ones who are doing the biggest amount of legwork in the desktop Linux space. If you have more strengths that you think the Linux desktop has as a desktop specific operating system, then let me know down in the comments below. And or, as always, you can find me on Twitter at InGalactic. But welcome to the channel if this is the first time you're here. And if you've been here from the start, big props to you. And if you've come somewhere in the middle, it's been so good to have you on the ride. I hope you've enjoyed the video. I'll see you in the next one. Hey, Blaine here. Thanks for checking out the Infinitely Galactic project. Look, if you want to find more videos like this, then definitely go check out the channel. Subscribe if you're new, turn on notifications, all that good stuff. And you can chat with me on Twitter at InGalactic. See you in the next one. Thank you.